Come Holy Spirit and enkindle within us the fire of your burning love. In your blessed name we pray. Amen. Good morning. So it turns out it's not ours and it never will be. And I'm sticking with that. The rich young man is earnest, faithful, and pragmatic. And he says to Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's it going to take for me to get saved? And Jesus replies, you know the deal? Follow the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Keep the Sabbath. Don't defraud. Honor your father and mother. And you can see it in the young man's eye, how his intent stare relaxes. And you can hear it in his voice. The urgency abates. Hey, hey, the man is thinking, I may be okay with this. Good teacher, I've done all of that since I was a child. And you know, now he's smiling, shaking his head, because he doesn't have to hunt this one down. He doesn't have to plot and plan, practice and rehearse. His wardrobe is fine. He's going to be okay. He's going to inherit eternal life because it requires nothing more than that which he has been doing all along. And all of that knowledge flies across the synapses of his brain and the endorphins of his well, of well-being flood the capillaries of his heart. He is flush. He is good. And then, and then Jesus says, looking at him and loving him, there's just one thing. Go and sell all that you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. Let it all go. Give it all away. Sell it at a loss. Give your money to the fellow who's standing on the entrance to the lodge and then come and follow me. Oh, now the man's breath quickens and his pupils dilate and his skin gets a little clammy because, because that's all I have. That's that's who I am. That's how I know that I'm okay. Letting go of all of that, giving it away to the poor, that, that's going to be like separating the marrow from the bone. It's possible, but after you do it, it is nearly impossible to stand up after. So being the pragmatist, our man, the one who I sometimes feel like I bear the most resemblance to of all the gospel characters, our man, my man, and perhaps your man, turns and walks away because that's just not going to happen. He's a pragmatist, and what Jesus has just said is not so practical. Metaphor, maybe. Hyperbole, perhaps. Poetic license, for sure. But for real? Sell it? Give it all away, how will I survive? How, how will he know who he is if he doesn't have those things to assure him that he matters? Not that long ago, amidst all of my sea kayaking adventures, I did something different. I branched out and I got serious about learning how to paddle a canoe. Now, certainly I had suffered through those high school river trips when you're in those ungainly, wallowing aluminum workhorses, those grumman canoes that you see in all the livery places up north, plodding down those algae-filled rivers. I had done that as a child, but never, 
Never had I actually been serious about paddling a canoe, a real canoe. But because the British Canoe Union, one of the certifying bodies that holds the licenses for my sea kayaking instructor certifications, pretty much decreed that if you were going to keep being a sea kayaker, sea kayaker instructor, you had to be a canoe coach. I set aside some time to discern the basics. And a dear, dear friend of mine who lives up north near Maple City Empire area is an amazing canoeist, so I gave him a call. And I asked him if he would teach me some of his skills. He said, sure. And so for four wonderful days, a few summers ago, he came home early from work every afternoon. And for four or five hours each evening, he took me paddling. And we were each in our own canoe, solo, side by side in these beautiful wooden wonders that he had built. And he taught me, he taught me the J-stroke, the C-stroke, the Canadian, the Indian, a variety of pries and draws and sweeps, and pretty soon, eventually, I could make my boat go forward and straight and turn all only paddling on one side. And quietly, we would make our way around some of those small lakes up there, and the zen of paddling would fill my body. Now, on our last day, we changed venues, and we went on a slow-moving river. It was narrow, with many bends and turns. And as we unloaded our boats and carried them on our shoulders to the water's edge, we saw a Canadian goose that looked to be ill, kind of perched to the side. And it didn't move at all when we walked past it with the canoes. But then, when we pushed our boats into the stream, the goose honked, flapped its wings, and got into the river right behind our boats. And off we went, slowly paddling down the river around the corners and into the lily pads. Well, actually, I went into the lily pads. Dick just went around the corners. And the goose followed. For an hour and a half, the goose followed us, pausing when we paused, waiting patiently when I needed to back up because I had gotten myself stuck in the weeds, sitting behind me, giving me a wide berth because it was clear to both of us that I was something of a menace in the water with that boat. But then when we reached our midpoint and Dick and I just sat in the river having our lunch next to each other, our goose, because I had begun to think of it as our goose, as we ate our sandwiches, it sat between us, periodically duck diving to get any minnows that were going by. It stayed with us. And then after we'd all eaten, we turned around and we headed back upstream. Dick and me and our goose. Now this time, because we were going upstream, Dick and I were able to paddle faster than the goose was able to keep up. And at one point, we went around a bend in the river, and we were out of its eyesight, and it squawked and honked loudly, and it flapped its wings, and it took to the air, and it flew over the bend, and then it came skidding in right behind us, shaking its bill as if to say, hey, I couldn't see you anymore. Don't get too far away. And all the while, Dick and I kept marveling because neither one of us had ever seen anything like this before. And for another hour and a half, 
It followed us back to the start, paddling along, always staying about four feet behind us. And when we landed, it climbed back up on shore and resumed the perch where it had been when we arrived. Now, meanwhile, I'd been thinking. And, and, and I realized, you know, Dick has a farm. And on the farm, he's got a horse and a pony and a mule and goats and, and more to the point, 17 ducks. And I said, Dick, we have to take the goose home with us. The goose likes us. It needs us. What's it going to do without us? I have a towel. We have a towel in the truck. I can just wrap it in the, tra- in the towel, and then I can hold it in the truck as we drive home. And then it could be in the pen with the ducks, and it would be there, and we'd know where it was. And Dick who is much smarter than I am, just said, Bonnie, I am not taking a wild goose home in the cab of my truck. If it wants to come visit, it can fly behind us and find us there. And then it came to me. In the Celtic tradition, the Holy Spirit is portrayed not as a passive, cooing dove, but as a loud, honking, squawking, wild goose present in our lives, following close by, but never, ever, the Holy Spirit is never, ever under our control. And it was then that it became clear that I and the rich young man have a lot in common, getting confused with what's mine and what's God's and what's in our control and what's on loan. And what I think I and perhaps you and the rich young man need to know is it's not ours. It never was. And at its very best, All of our stuff is just on some sort of long-term intergalactic loan. We can't hold it, trap it, pen it, or buy it because it's not ours and it never was. But God, like that honking goose, diligently paddling after us, keeping watch after us, is there and always will be. And that's it. Until we meet the goose on its own terms, we will never fully comprehend the beauty of this life and our role in this world Paddle slowly, take it all in. Be the reliable, gracious stewards. But friends, don't try to take it home because it's not ours. It never has been and it never will be. And thanks be to God. Dear friends, life is short. And we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who journey the way with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen.